Well, good morning, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said well. Today, what we're gonna vlog is something that I fell down the rabbit hole investigating last night. When I was younger, in my early teens, they used to broadcast something called UWF, Universal Wrestling Federation, and it was a lot of wrestlers that I recognized from WCW and WWF, but this was something totally different, a whole different wrestling organization, and I never really knew anything about it to this day until last night when they showed the dark side of the ring telling the story of Herb Abrams, the man who started this, and how it all happened. After I got done watching it, I started investigating a little bit more and found out that quite a bit of the history took place out here in Los Angeles and I can actually go to some of the places and tell you some of the stories so I thought that might be fun today to go show some of the places that these stories took place at you know if you watch this um, Vice documentary Dark Side of the Ring and saw this this will help you kind of envision where some of these places or these events happen now Everybody has a crazy story in their life and Herb Abrams might be one for the ages So you guys even if you're not a wrestling fan I think you're really gonna enjoy hearing about this. This was an organization that really Started from a guy no one ever heard of he got a lot of big-name wrestlers and within six years He was dead days with Jordan the lion begins Now so our first stops gonna be out in Reseda to a Venue that we've been to probably two years ago to vlog called Chuck Landis Country Club All right now we're on Sherman Way. That's what we're looking for. Well, this building in front of us was once, throughout the 80s and 90s, one of the biggest rock and roll clubs in the San Fernando Valley. Many music videos were filmed here, tons of memorable concerts, and in fact, Boogie Nights had quite a bit of their scenes filmed inside here as well. But in 1990, a man named Herb Abrams did the unthinkable. He challenged Vince McMahon in the wrestling world to be a rival. So in 1990, there was a Wrestling Fans Fantasy Weekend, and it was a big convention, the, really the first of its kind, where fans could go and meet all of their favorite wrestlers, managers, and personalities from the big wrestling promotions. Now, Herb Abrams was a guy that no one knew anything about, and he showed up and made a big announcement here that he was going to be doing a wrestling promotion <laughs> the Universal Wrestling Federation and that he had already aligned himself with one of the biggest names in wrestling, Bruno San Martino. Once he did that, people kind of started taking him a little bit seriously. He also had secured a deal for television for sport with Sports Vision. And so here he was basically funded by a television station to come up with a rival to WWF, WWE. Now Herb went out, made this announcement, and then he took the opportunity while he was there, since all these wrestlers were there, to basically poach talent, unhappy talent from the other promotions, offering them more money, uh, less travel, less uh, dates altogether, basically, that it really sounded like a dream to a lot of them that wanted to be home more with their families. So he was able to secure quite a few big, big names and in 1990, for a year, right here behind me at Chuck Landis Country Club, they filmed those television shows, what would be known as the Fury Hour. Now at the time, this was packed. He was able to actually pack this place out because it wasn't all that big, a few hundred people, maybe even a thousand, and he was out here taping, at the time, pretty decent wrestling. His whole idea was to remove the Vince McMahon aspect from it, which was the glitz and the glam, and take it back to old school style wrestling. And the people that he ended up signing on to work in his promotion, other than, you know, I mentioned Bruno San Martino wasn't going to wrestle, but he was going to be one of the main commentators. He had signed Cactus Jack, Captain Lou Albano, Dr. Death, Steve Williams, Sid Vicious, the Honky Tonk Man, Paul Orndorff, Bam Bam Bigelow. Uh, Greg the Hammer Valentine, the Killer Bees, the Powers of Pain, Jimmy Snuka, Dan Spivey, One Man Gang, Billy Jack Haynes, Cowboy Bob Orton. He had just over the span of this promotion, he got some of the biggest names you could possibly get. Unfortunately, the man Herb Abrams that was running it 
for one, didn't really know the wrestling business. Two, he had a massive drug addiction. He was a big cokehead and he spent a good portion of their budget on his own vices, meaning most of the times they were out traveling, he was getting the nicest hotel rooms and he was hiring hookers, he was having tons and tons of blow. Many wrestlers accounted for going into his room for meetings and him just constantly being naked and there always being piles of drugs on the tables. Now as you might imagine, that's not necessarily a recipe for success, but Herb Abrams had a really wild personality and people really liked him. In fact, he became known as Mr. Electricity and he was one of the first people to implement something that eventually would become later on in the 90s kind of the norm, which is he inserted himself in the storyline as the owner and would have rivalries, would wrestle matches, would just cut promos and really much to his personality made a lot of it about himself. As some of the wrestlers would say, if it entertained Herb, that was enough. He didn't really necessarily care whether he was entertaining anyone else. Except he was really trying to run something here that took a lot of money and he was blowing money left and right. One of the ways that he was saving money though, however, was he was not paying his talent. A lot of these wrestlers that he was hiring, when they went to cash their checks, it was coming up that the bank account had been closed. In fact, the Honky Tonk Man said that he had to go and file a grievance with the Athletic Commission in New York to ever get paid for one of the tapings that he did there. Now it's been sectioned off and this section of it is a part-time church. Hoping we could get inside and see some of it, but nope. Now even though Herb Abrams promotion here was not doing necessarily very well, he was not selling a ton of tickets when they would do shows because it was poorly promoted. Didn't bother him, he still went to Vince McMahon at one point and tried to align himself with him, offering to cover the promotions of the West Coast and Vince McMahon really had no interest in that, so that made Herb Abrams decide that this was now a rivalry. So now, Herb had a new motivation. It wasn't just about his ego in the form of him getting the attention for himself being on television. Now, he wanted the attention from Vince McMahon. He started doing everything he could to antagonize Vince McMahon. In fact, they said that if you looked at the uh, UWF belt, on both sides of the belt, it said UWF, and when you folded the belt to hold it to be shown on TV, it would say F U. And they said he did that intentionally to Vince McMahon, a message to Vince McMahon every time it was shown on television. Now with Herb's failing promotion, he decided to take a new attack. Even though it was failing, he decided to throw a pay-per-view and he did it in the most unorthodox fashion. He decided to choose a town, Palmetto, Florida, that was not a major town. There were not a lot of people coming and going from there. It was an hour away from the biggest town. And of course, as you might imagine, no one came. They sold literally two, 300 seats for a venue that held thousands. So they ended up having to black out most of the arena for it so that no one could tell there was no one in attendance. And they said it was one of the worst paid pay-per-views of all time. They said it was somewhat like 1,000 people purchased the pay-per-view. Unbelievable. And once again, much of the talent was not paid. So for the first year, they were filming all the Fury Hour here, and that was going strong, but then they hit a roadblock in 1992. Things were very sparse, and they didn't even do anything for 1993. I mean, they literally took a year off, and it was in one of the worst situations that it could be in. Herb kept trying to bring things back and decided to throw another pay-per-view. However, the talent was now getting wise to him because they were starting to believe that he had no money. Even though they were seeing him spend tons of money, they didn't believe that they were ever gonna get paid. So a lot of people, including the cameramen, showed up at Herb's hotel room one night and demanded to be paid and we're gonna throw him off of a balcony. And he called up the bank and proved to them, the people in the room, that he did have millions in his account. So they accepted checks and those checks bounced because what we would find out later was that Herb had two bank accounts. One account that he paid his big name stars and the people that he was probably afraid of. Those checks would always go through, including 
out of nowhere, he announced that he had Andre the Giant, one of the biggest names ever in wrestling. Andre the Giant showed up, and when Vince McMahon saw that, Vince immediately hired Andre back, and it was a total humiliation. But he was spending money on people like that, and the people that were showing up time after time were the ones that he was shortchanging. And so once again, he had this battle brawl, and it was pretty much a failure. He had his uh, main event with Sid Vicious and um, Dr. Death in a steel cage match and vowed that next year would be the uh, retaliation. They would have that same match again, except what he didn't count on with making that promise was that Sid, uh, at one time was known as Sid Vicious when he went to the WWE, he became Sid Justice. He had signed a contract with WWE, so he couldn't come back and do that. So they had to wait two years to have that match. And we're gonna go now to where that match was supposed to be. We're gonna go down to the Olympic Auditorium. Sometimes you never know what you're gonna find. So this is all the way down on Grand Avenue downtown. Well, what's now the Glory Church of Jesus Christ was at one time maybe the most famous wrestling venue in all of Los Angeles, right up there with the LA Sports Auditorium. This might be the biggest. This was the Grand Olympic Auditorium. Everyone from Classy Freddy Blassie to Luthez had wrestled here, now a church. But February 11, 1996, this was supposed to be the follow-up to, I think I said it was the Battle Brawl, it was actually the Blackjack Brawl. It had taken place at MGM and it was a total failure. Once again, poorly promoted. Um, Herb was totally strung out on cocaine the entire time. They had tons of problems and no one attended. So that happened in 1994. They, and he actually saw it as a, as a win, like a victory, because he was like, yeah, we, we did it at the MGM, even though no one came. So for the next year, nothing happened. And then uh, the Prime Network Television paid for what was going to be the follow-up. It was going to be the St. Valentine's Day Massacre here in 1996. And this was gonna be the rematch that I told you about. However, Herb had blown all of the money on cocaine and they ended up having to cancel the event. So even though it was really only that first year that Herb was really keeping things going, it was just sporadic filmings and live pay-per-views after that with years of breaks in between. But at this time, he had actually sold those old Fury Hours with a uh, promise to re-edit them to Prime Ticket. So those were actually being shown on Prime Ticket at the time, and right in front of us at this venue could have been, if he played his cards right, a way to turn it all around. Unfortunately, Herb didn't, and within a few months, Herb would be dead in New York City, one of the most bizarre, but the most Herb way to go there was. I've never actually been to this place. I'm really honored to see it because I remember when I interviewed Mae West's assistant, he said this was one of her favorite things to do was she loved to come to the boxing and wrestling matches here because her father was in that world and she was here all the time. And like I said, some of the biggest names in all of sports entertainment had performed here but that night, had they had that pay-per-view, that canceled card would have included Hector and Mondo Guerrero versus the Powers of Pain, uh, Jimmy Superfly Snooka versus Dr. Feelgood, Dan Spivey versus Cowboy Bob Orton, Candy Devine versus Luna Vachon, the Killer Bees versus Terry Funk and Dory Funk Jr. They were gonna have a psycho-aquatic torture match between Sabu and Cactus Jack, who later became uh, Mankind, Dude Love, and is known now as Mick Foley. And the headlining event was gonna be that rematch of Sid Vicious and Dr. Death, Steve Williams. When this all opens back up again, I might have to come to a service here just to see what the inside's like. So in July of 1996, Herb Abrams left this world the way he lived it. In his office, doing cocaine, they said that they the police were called because of a disturbance on the 17th floor where his office was in New York City. And when they got there, they found him with Vaseline and cocaine all over his body, chasing hookers around the office 
with a baseball bat. He had destroyed the whole place with a baseball bat and he ended up having a heart attack and passed away at the age of 44. And as you might imagine, Universal Wrestling Federation was then done. It was then closed, but ironically for a guy who ripped off so much of the talent, he had such a charisma and such a charm that people really liked him. And most of the wrestlers said that when they found out he passed, they were, they were genuinely sad, even though um, unbeknownst to them at the time, they worked many free events for him. Take a look at this place across the street from the auditorium. Auditorium's right there. Got Humpty Dumpty sitting up there. And a moose for some reason. Place is called Old Good Things. It's really sad that there's nothing here to denote that this was the great grand Olympic auditorium. No plaque, no old signs, nothing. Outdoor snack bar. All right, my friends, that's the end of our story today. That's the crazy story of the Universal Wrestling Federation and Herb Abrams. Have a ton of people to thank on Patreon today. Thank you to Marianne Geyser, Linda Million, Susan Witten, Christina, Becky Bradley, Alicia Coleman, Kirsten Lyle, Brian Belden, Greg Burris, Brendan Nobles, David Walden, Christine Cox, and Michelle Dalton for all becoming Patreons. Thank you so much. Have a great day, and we'll see you all next time. Good night.